I have uh, uh, four great talks. So let's start by Mohsen Lesani on certifying causality, consistent distributed key value stores. And by the way, Mohsen is also on the job market. Thanks a lot for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to present the paper Chapar, uh, Certified Causally Consistent Distributed Key Value Stores. I'm Mohsen Lesani. I collaborated with CJ Bell, and Adam Chipala is our advisor. So we are the end users of uh, distributed key value stores every day. That's the place where our uh, email and Facebook uh, data is stored. And we want these services to be available even if a server crashes. So there is no one server but geo-replicated servers. And if the user sends an update to one of these servers, an update is served to, uh, sent to the other replicas, and they are updated as well. And the good thing is that if one of these servers crash, the server you're connected to, then other servers can, can continue to give you the service. Uh, but that's, that's the good thing. But the question is, with this replication, how much consistency we can really provide? There is this uh, 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 interesting fundamental result from uh, Gilbert and Lynch in 2002 that says that uh, it's impossible to implement a read-write location uh, uh, that is both linearizable and always available. It, it presents a trade-off between availability and consistency. So maybe that's why most system designers, instead of targeting for linearizability, they target more relaxed notions of consistency that are collectively called eventual consistency. Examples of eventually consistent systems are uh, the, uh, Amazon Dynamo, uh, Facebook Cassandra, and CouchDB. And the high-level guarantee that these systems give you is that when all the messages in the system are processed, then eventually all the replicas are going to have the same state. That, that's what they give you at a very high level. And for sure, linearizable systems are more consistent, and eventually consistent systems are more responsive. And the CAP theorem says that there is an important line in between that says that only the systems below this line are partition tolerant. And of course, we want to be below this line because we want to keep the ser services available. Uh, and theoretical results suggest that causal consistency is one of the strongest notions of consistency that we can provide if a partition happens. Maybe that's why many pioneering systems like uh, causal memory, Bayou, Practi, and others have provided causal consistency a long time ago. And recent systems like Cops and Iger and Gentle Rain and Bolton uh, provide causal consistency. And in terms of performance, Iger reports that only, uh, there is only 15% overhead compared to uh, eventually consistent Cassandra on average, and on a realistic uh, Facebook benchmark, they show that the overhead is only 7%. Okay, let me introduce uh, causal consistency with an example. Alice uh, loses her ring and goes online and changes her status to lost my ring. And messages are sent to the other replicas. Arrows uh, show messages in these diagrams. Then she finds her ring and uh, posts again, uh, found my ring. And messages are sent again to Bob and Carol. And then Bob uh, views the status, uh, found it, and in response posts, glad to hear that. And again, messages are sent. Now Carol has received the first message from Alice and the message from Bob. Uh, uh, she reads Bob's message that is glad to hear that. And she's interested to know why Bob is glad. So she views uh, Alice's status, which is lost my ring. So Carol concludes that uh, Alice is, uh, uh, Bob is happy because Alice has lost her ring, which is not something that we really want to happen. But this is a completely acceptable execution in eventually consistent systems. Let us see what the problem is here and how we can solve it. Well, the glad to hear that uh, put operation by Bob was executed only after there was a get operation by him. Uh, so there is a so-called replica order dependency from uh, Bob's put uh, to his get operation. And that get operation itself is getting the value from Alice's put. So there is a so-called get from dependency from uh, uh, Bob's put to Alice's put. And dependency is transitive. So the put operation from Bob is dependent on Alice's second put operation. 
Now, the problem with Carol's uh, replica is that it has applied an update whose dependencies are not applied yet. She applies Bob's uh, update while, the, while Alice's update is not, uh, is not there yet. So causal consistency prevents this by requiring that uh, uh, every update is applied only if all the dependencies of the update are already applied in the, in the store. Distributed systems in general is complicated because we always have to uh, deal with node caches, message losses, message reorders, um, and specifically for relaxed notions of consistency, clients are exposed to less consistent data. And, and verification here for both for the implementations and the clients can, can improve the reliability of these systems. That's why we have built this uh, framework in Koch for, for verification of uh, both the implementations and the clients of causally consistent uh, distributed key value stores. Everything is uh, in dark blue here is something that the client has to, uh, the user of our framework has to write or prove. And everything is in uh, light blue, which was really green on my laptop, uh, uh, is part of the framework. So in the middle, we have this abstract causal operational semantics, uh, which is our specification for operational semantics. Given a concurrent program, it defines all the possible causally consistent executions of that program. It serves an as, as an interface between our implementation and our, cli uh, our, our clients. On the implementation side, we have defined the concrete operational semantics that models the uh, asynchronous network of uh, replicas. It models uh, node crashes, message losses, message reorders, uh, and it is defined parametric in terms of the interface of the implementations. We have defined a common interface for the implementations, and the concrete semantics is parametric in terms of that. We say that an implementation is causally consistent if the concrete semantics instantiated with the implementation is a refinement of the abstract semantics. And we found that to do this refinement, we need to define another uh, semantics, uh, an instrumented version of the concrete semantics. And we have proved once and for all that the concrete semantics is a refinement of the instrumented concrete semantics. And we have also proved that the instrumented concrete semantics is a refinement of the abstract semantics if a few conditions that we call well reception are satisfied. So this way we have a proof technique, uh, a set of uh, a sufficient condition for, for the proof of uh, in, uh, causal consistency of implementations. So there has been much effort uh, that uh, we have done to, to make this framework, but now new implementations can use the proof technique and prove causal consistency of uh, the new implementations uh, really quickly. On the client side, we say that a client is causally, uh, causally content if it never fails an assertion on the abstract operational semantics, which means that a causally consistent store is enough for them. And we have built a model checker uh, in Coq that uh, explores, uh, a very simple model checker in Coq that explores the state space of the uh, client program to make sure that no assertion fails when it executes on the abstract semantics. And the good thing about uh, the, the both sides of this uh, 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 framework is that both of them are implemented in Cox, so results from the two sides can be seamlessly composed. Let us look at the concrete operational semantics first. Here's the interface for the key value store uh, implementations. It's parametric in terms of uh, keys and values. Implementations are usually written in the, uh, in the classical functional programming style with uh, state passing, and clients are usually written uh, in, again, uh, the classical functional programming style, with, uh, but with monads, uh, a monad of uh, put and get operations. Uh, the client, uh, the, the, the programmer, has to define the, uh, the type of uh, the state that each replica stores, and the initial state, of course. And uh, 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 the put operation, given the current state, should return uh, the post state and also the messages that then the operational semantics is gonna broadcast to all other replicas. And the programmer has to define the message type as well. Given a message in a replica, first the guard um, uh, function is applied, and if the guard is satisfied, is, if it returns true, it's only then that the update function is called, which applies the message to the current state and returns a post state. And the guard function is very important. It's the place where the programmer can uh, program the logic to rule out the uh, uh, messages that, whose dependencies are not applied yet. And the get operation is easy given the current state. It returns a value for the given key and returns a post state. 
So that was a, the asynchronous uh, network, the model of the asynchronous network of replicas. Now let, let us look at the abstract semantics. Again, uh, abstract semantics is our specification for causal consistency. It's abstract from any implementation. It even doesn't uh, uh, involve message passing. It serves as, as an interface between implementations and clients, and the important thing is that, is that it is operational. I gave you a definition of causal consistency, an axiomatic one, when I, when I showed the uh, uh, last ring example. But with that definition, we cannot do model checking. With an operational semantics, we can model check the clients. And, and this operational semantics is what I'm gonna define now. Each state stores uh, A, the number of updates that this state has applied from every other node, and D, the number of put operations that this uh, uh, node is dependent on. When a put operation, we first assign a unique identifier to the put, which is the pair of the node identifier, and the number of the put in that uh, replica. And the dependencies of the put uh, operation are gonna be the dependencies of the replica in the pre-state of the put operation. Let's look at the update operation. Uh, here, the dotted arrow shows that we are interested to apply the, uh, an update from the put operation above. Uh, we are in a replica with state A prime and D prime. And for sure, the kind of condition is that all the dependencies of this put operation that are D here should be satisfied before we apply this update. More precisely, for R, all N and I in D, A prime of N should be greater than or equal to I. If this condition is satisfied, then we apply the update and we advance the number of uh, uh, apply, uh, the, 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 the applied count for the sender node. Something to notice here is that although we received uh, and applied this message, we didn't change the dependencies of the node. The reason is that we received an update, but we really didn't read it yet. What we do is that we store the dependencies of this value, which is the identifier of the originating put operation, and its dependencies D, together with the value for the key. And when the get operation happens, it is then that the uh, dependencies of the uh, state of uh, this replica is extended with the dependencies of the value. You see that it's extended there. Okay, I showed you the concrete semantics and I showed you the abstract semantics. Now let us talk about the instrumented concrete semantics. There is a gap between the concrete and abstract semantics. Uh, there is no notion of dependency in the uh, concrete semantics. Here's an execution of the concrete semantics. We do a put, messages are sent to the other replicas. The second replica applies the guard and then the update. And, uh, and then the get happens in the second replica, reading the same key. Now, here we need to define the uh, gets from relation. We have written a value, we have gotten a value, but we don't know where this value has come from. To, to, to be able to define this relation, the get, get from relation, what we do is that we instrument the operation of semantics. We assign unique identifiers to the put operations, which is the, ident uh, which is, uh, the identifier of the node, uh, pair of the identifier of the node and the number of put operations in that replica. And then we instrument. And the reason that we can instrument was that the, alg the algorithm, the implementation, was defined uh, parametric in terms of the value V, uh, the type V. So we instantiate it with the instrumented uh, value type here. So you see that the value V1 is instrumented with the identifier, then the message is instrumented with the identifier, and the instrumentation continues for the guard and update uh, functions. And the good end result is that for a key, K1, not only we have the value V1, but also the identifier of the originating put operation. So we can quickly define the gets from relation. Now we know where the, where the value came from. And uh, the replica order uh, dependency could be defined before. And now we can define the causal dependency relation as the transitive closure of the union of these two operations. Great, we could define uh, uh, causal dependency. Now let us look at the well reception proof techniques. We are gonna use this uh, uh, causal dependency relation that we defined. Okay, so the well reception proof technique requires that we define a function, uh, rec, uh, that given a state, a replica state, and a node identifier is supposed to return the number of messages that that state has received from that uh, node or replica. At the beginning, rec is supposed to return zero 
uh, for any, any replica because no messages is received yet. Um, on a put operation, uh, 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 the condition is that the break function should be incremented only for the node itself and should remain unchanged for the other nodes. The reason is that uh, doing a put is like receiving uh, uh, a message from the node itself. You, we are sending updates to the other, uh, we are sending an update to the other uh, nodes, uh, but we are applying that update to the current node right away. So that's why the rec function should be incremented for the node itself and should remain unchanged for the other node. On the guard or application of a, an update, we should first uh, uh, make sure that this is the uh, message that we expected to receive. If we have received I messages, uh, if we are receiving the message uh, number I, if we are receiving the message number I, we should have re received uh, uh, I minus one messages from that sender. That's the first condition. The message is the next that we expect. And after we do the update, the rec function uh, should increment only for the sender node and should remain unchanged for the other nodes. And the get operation is easy because uh, uh, no messages is received in a get transition. So what we have to prove is that the rec function is, remains unchanged for all nodes, for all replicas when a get operation happens. All of these together, all of these three conditions together say that the rec function is really representing the number of received messages. And now we can use this to define the uh, important condition, which says that if uh, the guard to apply an update is satisfied that the replica, uh, and that update is dependent on other uh, updates, those up updates are, are applied to this replica. More precisely, for, the, for example here, we are, uh, we are looking at Carol's node with state SC, and the guard function for the put operation above, glad to hear that from Bob, is satisfied. And that put operation is dependent on uh, Alice's put operation with identifier A and I. The condition here is that uh, rec of SC and A should be greater than or equal to I. We should have received at least I messages from replica A. So if that's true, then uh, dependencies are satisfied and it's okay to apply this update to this replica. These conditions, together with a small side condition, imply causal consistency. So we have a proof technique uh, for, uh, for the proof of causal consistency for the implementations of key value store algorithms or implementations. Um, and this is good because it factors out a lot of proof for no algorithm. And let me note that this is a sufficient condition, but not a necessary condition. Uh, we have uh, applied this uh, technique, this proof technique, to two uh, implementations from the literature. One is called causal memory. The other one is called Iger. Uh, and we have uh, proved the uh, causal consistency for these implementations. And uh, after, after the verification effort, we have extracted these implementations from Hawk to OCaml, and we have linked the results with uh, uh, communication primitives in OCaml libraries, like uh, TCP uh, IP socket library, and what we have built is uh, distributed stores that we know keep the causal consistency. We know preserve causal consistency. Uh, we have also experimented with the uh, stores that we have made. Uh, uh, we conducted a simple experiment with uh, a cluster of four nodes, and each node processed 60,000 uh, messages uh, or requests. Uh, on the x-axis, uh, here you see uh, different workloads from 10% to 90% uh, get operations versus put operations. And on the y-axis, you see the throughput, which is the number of operations uh, per second uh, per node. And you see that the second implementation is more efficient, and the reason is that it uh, uh, keeps a more accurate account of dependencies. So messages tend to uh, uh, leave in the uh, queues uh, for a shorter amount of time. They're applied faster, so the throughput, the, the throughput of the system is higher for, for the second implementation. So in summary, I uh, presented Chopper, which is a framework for the verification of both implementations and the clients of uh, uh, distributed, uh, key value store, uh, key, distributed key value stores, and it specifically targets causal consistency. Thanks a lot, and I would be happy to get questions.
So, Constantine and I are from uh, Paris Diderot. So, I have two questions. One is, uh, so this REC functions that you presented is like a, like a sort of implementation of the vector clocks algorithm, like uh, the one of Lampert and so on? Or? Yes, it can be. Actually, I have slides. I expected this question. Uh, Yes, it is, and uh, so, so vector clock is one way of implementing this, this semantics. That says that I send the vector clock of the pre-state together with the message, and the guard function is gonna be that my vector clock locally at the, 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 the replica should be greater than or equal to the vector clock of the message that I've received. But this is one simple way of implementing it. There are more but this, uh, no, uh, the, my question was, I mean, also for when you define these rec functions and so on, you also have this, uh, like, I'm checking whether I received at least that kind of messages from uh, the, the, I mean, some node, etc. Et I mean, for me, this is like more or less, uh, I mean, it's very close to this vector clocks, no? Or uh, maybe I'm wrong. Well, maybe again, I'm... vector clocks is one way of implementing uh, these mm. stores. There are other ways, and we have verified algorithms that use are more smart ways. Actually, vector clocks is not the most efficient way of uh, uh, keeping, uh, uh, maybe it's efficient, but it's not precise way of keeping uh, uh, causal dependencies. It's an over approximation. Okay, uh, okay and then? The, the rec function, the rec function you, when, when your, your, your algorithm is implemented using the vector clock is directly the vector clock. Uh -huh. When the implementation is more involved, Better you, either you have a state that represents this rec or you have constructed from the state that you have stored. And then just one other question. When you are proving this refinement between the concrete implementation and the abstract one, do you assume something about the network, the fact that messages are always received or uh, stuff? Oh, yeah, good, good question. So in our uh, uh, semantics, in our concrete semantics, we have uh, um, uh, model crashes of the node, 